Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here in the middle of a new campaign. And do you know the last of your boats we're playing as everyone's favorite, Kennedy, one of them, maybe, this Robert guy. So if you like to read about him, please go ahead, but inauguration day. The American people have spoken, they want justice over nepotism and peace over chaos. By the powers granted to me by your holy constitution, I promise to legislate and implement an act that will unite America. No longer shall we be divided between black and white men and women. The America tomorrow will be one where each and every one of us will have to do our part to bring a great nation to the future. God bless America. RFK's speech was a testament to his late brother's legacy and his final project, implementing a lot of soft segregation dedicated to that cause. The question remains, will he be able to do it? Tensions in America is larger than, than in a long time, and his presidency is predicated on the cooperation with the national faction. The artist segregation is not knowing to play in the eyes. Good luck, Kennedy. You'll need it. Hail to the chief. And the Kennedy presidency. Now, I've read all this before, but it's been a, quite a while since I've actually done any of this stuff. Um, so, let's see what it's like. Election Day has come and passed, and RFK is now the 36th president of the United States. The heir, new heir to one of America's greatest families has blazed a uh, cross-country campaign trail, promising to deliver equality and for all Americans. To the worker, he promised better wages and better workplaces. To the old and infirm, he promised <clears throat> uh, pensions for the hard work. To the sickly, he promised health care. Uh, uh, robust and cheap. To the homeless, he promised homes of their own. Um, to the colored man, he promised the rights which they have been withheld for decades. They can live freely and securely in the land of the birth. Though they have been subjected to both doubt and ridicule from both his opponents and his own party, the results speak for themselves. President Kennedy has work cut out for him in the months ahead. Cracks are starting to show on the MPP's United Friend, the RDs, or from County to save already pledged to Stonewall's legislation. But America is downtrodden now looking for deliverance, as they once did his brother. If Jack never quit, even in his final seconds, neither of them will bobby them. Also, um, catch you up on speed. Here's the, uh, there's the RFK, Chaos in the Horn of Africa, pretty normal. We're in South Africa right now fighting. We're doing pretty darn well already. Um, Strom Thurmond named President Pro Temporum. At the commencement of the most recent session of Congress, General J. Strom Thurmond was elected to the po post of President Pro Tempore of the U.S. Senate. Was supposed to judicially gun to the longest serving member of the majority party, Thurmond's initiative in leading the Southern Exodus and founding the National Progressive Pact, led to the pact choosing him for the post instead of longer serving MPP senators such as James Eastland or Richard Russell Jr. The MPP's comfortable majority was secured a swift election. The role of the President Pro Tempore is to preside over the Senate in the Vice President's absence. The President Pro Tempore is also third in line of presidential succession after the Vice President and Speaker of the House. Otherwise, the position is largely ceremonial. The South is glad that one of the boys is a top office and the Progressive Bloc is content to pro compromise on his minor issue to move the pack forward. Congratulations, Senator Thurman. A message from McCormick to his successor, Mr. Kennedy. The day my father died was one of the worst memories of my moments of my life. I was 13 years old, living in Boston, and poor as Job's Turkey, or Job's Turkey. I wasn't able to go to high school because I had to work to support my mother and my siblings. First doing the newspaper routes, then the odd jobs at Western Union. I felt alone, desolate, I never thought I'd amount to anything. And this world was swallowed away up like I had so many other people in my life. Still, I told myself I had to try for my family. I found a job as an errand boy at a law office, and over the course of many long, hard years, built up the knowledge I needed to pass the bar. A decade later, I was elected to Congress. It would be foolish to say that my own experiences mean that I have any sense of the agony that you are currently going through now. Every tragedy is unique in the pain it inflicts. The wounds remain with us with our entire lives, unseen by the outside world, but those same pains serve as a reminder of our obligations to people who we have lost and those who remain with us. Your brother was a good man. He was one of the most decent men of the grace of the halls of Congress in my entire career. There I admired him deeply for the passion with which he pursued the issues important to him and the ideals in which he viewed our country. The whole leaves behind, he leaves behind, cannot ever be filled. But we must endure in spite of that. We must press forward to give this country hope again to offer to some prospect of improvement. There are millions across the country who still have in dire poverty, who are deprived of access to basic accommodations, who live under the constant threat of violence. Even as we grieve, we must find some way to ease their suffering. I know you will make your brother proud. Godspeed. He tries to hold it in, but tears fall drop by drop upon the letter, blurring its ink. So we're doing all right here. Um, these guys are still pretty strong, but ooh, the game is lagging horrible. Even though know, I just loaded my computer. Um, we're still looking through that. So, um, so I did use consequence already. In terms of, because last time we played RFK, and I know this happens every single time with RFK, uh, we, he can get assassinated. That's, that's what happened, I think, my first time I played as him. I played him again, again before too, but I think he gets assassinated still, so I set the variable to like zero, so hopefully he doesn't. And also to let you know, um, we are trying to get George Romney in this run too. Not RFK, really. Really, I do want George Romney. We give him a work with him, that's fine. Um... Over our leadership, and different. Uh, so they're cooperating. They're astounding, but these guys, it, progressive caucus, is kind of like, uh, date social spending. Yeah, that's fine. Champion American victories. Yeah, we'll see about that. Home front, we close out of that. CIA, we still need that. 
Um, is that too? Because we're not done researching everything here, which kind of sucks. But honestly, we'll get done researching a lot, pretty much most of the stuff pretty soon, actually. So I'm not super concerned, but we might want to get the tree ports as fast as possible, figuring it all out. We don't need really need more stability immediately. But happy February, everybody. As the game is lagging, we have less than 200 billion in debt. Getting the tree ports in Hawaii back would probably be the biggest boon to our popularity. Iron Glove. Uh, let's do that one first. With Kennedy elected, we now stand to undertake a task to decide the direction the administration goes for, towards the next four years. With Kennedy having to appease both the party and the voters, he walks a tight line of putting those he finds honorable and those he finds just as another career politician who jumped on the National Progressive back bandwagon. With multiple candidates vying for the top spot and only the few spots to go around, Kennedy must use carefully. A star rises in Michigan. If you're wondering about George Romney, please go right ahead. He's an RDC uh, member. Uh, Operation success is good. Um, so he is a guy. He is a Republican. A Mormon in the White House? Never. Figuring it all out. My fellow Americans, I'll be frank, the past three years have wrecked a terrible toll upon the United States and our institutions. Fear for the future runs rampant. <clears throat> um, yet distrust for those oath sworn to lead this nation through it grows with each scandal. But we must give in to our lesser natures and believe that nothing can right America's path before the turn will return. I think not. American people are no strangers to crisis. It's as dark as the times where our way character and strength to shine brightest, and Americans have showcased great fortitude and unity in every war and depression that has sailed us for 200 years. We've been dealt bloody many times in the past, but we eventually recover from each. We've emerged stronger than before. My fellow Americans, I only ask one thing from you and one thing new ask only to believe. Believe in the fortitude that resides in your hearts. Believe in that goodwill that guides our thoughts and actions. Believe that this great country will survive the present crisis. Just as it has survived worse in the past, believe that the present will pass and together we will find a way back towards the future every American, no matter the race, class, or creed, can look forward to. New president, new America. RFK. I spent years devoted to his work, allowing himself a few pleasures. As so as he thought, it was only fair that after being inaugurated president of the United States, he uh, should allow himself a night of overindulgences with a bottle of Malbec and his beautiful wife. Unfortunately, the pleasures of yesterday pale in the dawn of light of dawn. Hungover, stomach lurking, lurching, the new president plastered a smile onto his face as he mounted to the podium in the White House press room to give his first speech to the nation. My fellow Americans, it is with great pride that I come before you today as your president. To have put your trust in me, as you did in my father and brother before me, does, a, does me a great honor. He stifled a sudden burst of melancholy at the thought of Jack forcing himself to carry on. Now that I am your president, I may finally address the issues our nation faces today. Rapid inequality, political instability, growing isolationism on the world stage. It's no secret that we live in turbulent times. He took a breath. But together we can move past them. I believe in an America with rights for all of our people, regardless of the race. An America purged of this injustice and equality that ought to have remained in the previous century. An America taking your rifle plates as a force for global good. It's my dream. I would like to make it your dream as well. I hereby pledge before the country I love so dear that I will reform this great nation of ours together. As Americans, we may face anything. And so on. It seems to have a strong impact on the press. Thought Kennedy as he left the podium. You don't hope that after Nixon's duplicity. The people are ready to believe in the president again, to believe in a better tomorrow. Our lives shall burn the pathway to stars and lifelines for revolutions. Um, I think I did this one before. Um, if you want to read this, please go to head. Better safe than sorry. I'm pretty sure I read it before. I've read the most of these at least once, even after the unfinished business for Toolbox 83 update. <laughs> at this point, I'm just here to just kill us off as many enemies as possible. So, figuring it all out. The Iron Glove, one of the most important positions in the cabinet is that of the Secretary of Defense. And President Kennedy has certainly not failed to deliver. When he came to the candidate for the position of Secretary of Defense, few had his impressed career as Henry Andrews Lucci. The liberator of nearly 513 men who had suffered in the Bataan Death March and then imprisoned in the Kantan uh, Kaban Tuan prison camp and the recipient of the two bronze stars, the Purple Heart and the Distinguished Service Cross, Evermore. As the identity is an Italian American, the first ever to appoint a cabinet, and the Roman Catholic makes him popular with both groups, who roundly, roundly praised President Kennedy's choice. Mucci has expressed a modern and calm opinion of domestic matters, a stance on international fascism, especially the people who are responsible for the atrocities in the Philippines, as a stern and as harsh as ever. The memories of the cruelty of those who deny the freedoms of man remain fresh in his mind, and he's not likely to forget them. He speaks often and carry a giant stick. Civilizing influence of women, huh? Our moral shadow. The United States is perhaps the greatest nation in modern history. Its footprint spans from the far shores of Australia to the icy mountains of Iceland. The only challenge is being the barbarous Japanese and the failing Germans. There is no doubt our freedom will span the rest of the world in no time. Well, a fair nation faces a paradox, however. Uh, while we pr project Uncle Sam on every continent, Uncle Sam himself is a sickly weak. His fingers ache with arthritis, and his stomach grumbles with the hunger of a nation subsiding on little but what he can beg for. As we throw our money in army and navy off to fight foreign lands, to foreign lands to fight foreign foes, we let our own people starve and grovel for scraps. No matter how much it costs to the very bones and blood of our nation, we must close this very great gaping fault in our great country, not just for America, but for the world. Party above all. Use your allies for temporary votes across the aisle. Uh, more liberal candidate. Ooh. Necessary sacrifice. Give a majority by any means. 
Uh, I think I'll probably go across the aisle. The party above all. Because we don't want to be seen as... Uh, I did set the assassination level to zero, so... We'll see. Across the aisle, the eternal chaos of American politics has only been tempered by the fortune election of the National Progressive Pact of Power. It still stands built on a shaky foundation of corruption, partisanship, and power mongering, and war profiteering. While Kennedy has been working to finally put this chaos to rest, decided that to do this, he must work with the enemy. Temporarily, of course, not permanent. <clears throat> RFK announced a new policy cooperating with the Republican Party, especially over the socially liberal policies, as well as a progressive use in the welfare state. With the Republican Party being essentially forced to take any opportunity they can, they've grabbed Kennedy's generous hand with eagerness. Now with the MPP and the Republicans working hand in hand, he can finally put the death roads to the old American politics to rest. These Democrat allies. Well, before we do that, really, let's get 50 political power. Um, today, history's made former Senator Marie Newberger becomes the first woman to be put in the cabinet of the United States. The President's new Secretary of the Treasury, Newberger, resigned her Senate seat in order to take up a new position. A veteran of Oregon State politics, along with her late husband Richard Marine, was elected to the Senate in the 50s. Her husband shortly following her to become the Senate's first husband and wife legislative team. Newberger continues to serve following Richard's death from cancer in 1960. Immensely popular in Oregon, Newberger was made, has made a name for herself as a staunch progressive, particularly on social issues such as civil rights and health care. I also have questioned the decision of appointing a politician known for a president's focus on social issues to a larger economic position. The president picked her for that exact reason, to ensure that his administration would not prioritize profit over people, nevertheless. It's a sad reality that women can't get far in federal politics without being th uh, as shrewd as a fox. Behind Newberger's soft voice and warm, warm smile, but as a clever political operator, well experienced and glad handling of Washington, making her a strong asset to the inexperienced president. If you want something done in politics, ask a woman. Well, it depends on who you ask. You guys go this way. There you go. Dinosaur of the party. The Secretary of State of the United States of America bears an immense responsibility, being in charge of the President's diplomatic choices of the State Department and the appointment of the vast and diverse multitude of personalities who carry the diplomatic actions of the nation. With this in mind, President Kennedy's choice for the office. Cloud, Dennis, and Pepper represents the interests of the common man while deftly managing the immense and towing, towing mountain of bureaucracy that the Department of State demands, being a staunch progressive in a rock against anti democratic movements that have rocked the U.S. and its international alliances. Pepper finding an ideological line with Kennedy after rising from the murk of Floridian local government to the heights of the Senate years ago is now one of the President's most viable allies. Bringing with him years and years of worth of connections, alliances, and most importantly, legitimacy is one of the Congress's longest serving progressives. It's part of the grand plans the President now has to reform and make better the last bastion of freedom in the world. If at first he does succeed, try, try again. What if he came over here and just like blitz through here? I might be able to do that. It is some plenty of planes too, so I'm not super worried about this. Plenty of planes. So I haven't exploded yet, which is good. Check the economy. So I'm doing a lot of tax tax hikes. Happens. Oh, also I do want to show you the senators. Uh, and now they did explode. Okay. Um, we have 18 Republicans, 22 Democrats, 23 Progressives, and 35 Nationalists. So even if we get Republicans on our side, Democrats are still not enough. We need the we need the center. Necessary sacrifice. Share the progressives of 20 or more senators. The Democrats will enter temporary laws to pass civil rights legislation. Hmm. Because the nationals won't go for that anyways. So we'll see. Uh, but I do want to send these guys down here too. Well, we can't do that. Okay then. Now we can. Gotta get both those. Thank you. Send two, huh? Also, I deleted most of the army, as you can see. Um, all right. Civil War resumes. Pretty normal. We'll probably need need a lot of political power for Bobby here. Good old Bobby Kennedy. Yep, oh god, we're gonna need more divisions, my bad. Well, I mean, I guess not, just because that happened eventually, but... You know, actually, we will need more divisions. Your choice is not an echo, your America, your future. Oh, we can't trade anymore. Anyway, no. Well. Well, just await them. America's last bastion of democracy on Earth, and yet whole generations feel do not a choice. America's citizens are Republican, yet the uh, Kingmakers, Kennedy, Rockefeller, Lodge, and New York, and Washington claim to speak for the Americans from Gus Gus. America has no need for Prince and will-be dynasty, and yet these claimants and steal the country forever in the direction. All is not lost, but the road to claim America starts from each and every one of us to make your voice heard in the boardrooms and parlor halls of power. America is a choice, a choice that is in your hands. 
I hardly any broadside against the accepted wisdom of our age. Phyllis Schleifies. A choice not an echo raises questions that should be concerning every civic minded American. From Welsh. Paid for by the John Birch Society in Indianapolis, Indiana. Surprisingly popular despite its con conspiratorial tone. And this sacrifice rally the progressives. Um, none of us contributed more to the black American suffering than the Dixiecrats of old new. The gen geriatric band of white good old boys hold an iron grip on the reins of power throughout the South, eager to defend Jim Crow under the flimsy pretense of states' rights. If one wonders why supposedly free men continue to live like slaves in Alabama, Louisiana, and dozen other states, look no further. Unfortunately, such cretins also comprise a size proportion of the MPP. Since having split from the Democrats, Wallace and Scrooge rail against the slightest push for civil rights in the former corner of the Congress. His work carries far beyond our party and across party lines into the millions of black minded Americans. Despite misgivings, President Kennedy has decided to parlay the party right in a series of publicized meetings. No doubt they will demand concessions in exchange for support, but we do not have the luxury of choice. We don't have it. Either the Civil Rights Act passes, albeit heavily reduced, or it does not pass at all. Keep majority by enemies necessary. I'll have a cool of that, huh? And need you conundrum. If you want to do this, please go ahead. We're going to turn up the heat. Just go ahead. Y'all can just go here. Do that. Figure out what you're going to do. Shoot another guy. Thank you. Um, Democrats. Republicans. Honestly, I would rather do nationalists, but whatever. Let's go straight to Bogata. You should be fine no matter what. Moral shadow across the aisle. Indonesia burns. I'm um, going to that place you're ahead. The bullish dot uprising. I'm going to this place you're ahead as well. You need the war as goes on. Yes. They're over there. Um, striking a match, Claude Pepper, Secretary of State, lit his and the President cigars. Cubans, Mr. President, a gift from Fidel himself, best in the world, the absolute best. Indeed, replied Kennedy, smiling blithely. blithely. There's still perks for having friends overseas. I wish, only wish we could give the Belgian chocolate. Two men puffed away in a comfortable silence, filling the Oval Office with slow, drifting waves, wafts of blue smoke. With the air of a man drinking up the thought of a deep slit in his mind, Kenny said, You know, Cloud, we're going to have to make some changes. Malaya, Africa, all these crises show the world in turmoil, and the voters want to show our teeth when the fascists come knocking. That's the way the wash Republican Democratic right out of the White House. They're going to show him a firm hand with the jab, so the wash was right back out in the C68. Exulting in a thin stream of smoke, Pepper tapped a cigar into the ashtray. Smiling at the president with the nicotine stained teeth, he said, Darn straight, Bobby. We're going to give Hiroheat to the spanking his daddy ought to give him. Kenny was unable to prevent his mouth curving in amusement. That we will, Claude. That we will. Time to rattle some sabers. Fighting tyranny since 1776. Uh, I'm pretty sure I read this all before. Mr. Preparedness, because we want to get it on to Tokyo as fast as possible. It's have to be after next season. Oh, really? Well, basically, we have to wait until the next election, huh? Really, bro? Um... That's weird. So you can't just, like, gimp it? And, uh... Huh. That's interesting. Well, I'll keep going this way then first, and then we'll go down that way. There may be a few, but men and women of good principles still remain within the white gold edifices of Washington, D.C. These advocates for change come from many backgrounds and classes that caucus for different parties, but all believe that the United States is in dire need of political, social, and economic reform. For the progressive movement, the other option guarantees America's survival both in the near and far future. Currently, America's progressives rally under two factions, President Kennedy's own progressive caucus and Senator Lyndon Johnson's Democrats. Both extremes of the MPP will raise objections over cooperating with the RDC and Senator Johnson is infamous for both his temperament and his peculiarities. Nonetheless, bipartisanship accords legitimacy to legislation in the eyes of the American people, which should be unity with their natural allies across the aisle can smoother the passage of the progressive policies for the less backlash and compromise. We'll see. And yes, we will. We will definitely see. Um... That one and grab. Failed coup in Ecuador. <laughs> nice.
go. Republicans, Democrats. Um, I don't necessarily want to do that, but we do want to do that. Oh, we're doing the Nationals a small favor. Increase our standing. Big favor. Both with us as well. Medium standing. Fill the coffers. I need a lot of political power for this. Oh, conflict status down here. Um, slam the brakes. Uh, Nicole's room somewhere in the vast halls of the Department of State is a large table littered with maps and drawings and printouts. Crowding around tables that are men in dark suits packing closely to listen all across the room faces are serious. Their minds deeply focused on the hand of task. Task at hand. Smith, the Department Head for Nash International Security Affairs, is at the front looking most serious of all and beginning to read at this morning's briefing. Thank you for coming today. I believe all of you have seen the recent statements from the Australian government calling for a full-scale invasion or intervention, Smith said. That's around the front pages of every single newspaper in the country. I'll take the opportunity to clear up our department's official position. While we appreciate the enthusiasm, we will not recommend a direct intervention into Indonesia. <clears throat> Scattered murmurs fluttered around the room. Some of the Sony's faces show flashes of concern. Would America be wobbly at a time of great need? Make no mistake, we're just as committed to the war as Australians are. This position may even change the future, but we understand that escalating the war so quickly comes with the risks that are too, far, too high to bear. But abundantly, we risk war with Japan itself. That's even to quiet the room when Smith continued. Look, we'll say we'll be escalating the conflict. We will, but gradually. I trust that you'll do a good job making sure the Australians know that. Smith was almost done now. The men were ready to leave. As they prepared to go to their tasks, Smith had one final message. Remember, Sloan said he wins the race. Play this group. Sure. Loans for democracy, huh? Looking pretty good here still. Maybe with LBJ. Two bars with different histories, but goals alike. But in Washington, D.C., the capital of their fair union, where civil agreements makes uh, life nice, <coughs> and Overland finds itself in new trouble. Two rivals are brought together by fight and justice. Today, Bobby went to meet with LBJ, the leader of the Democrats, to discuss plans for the presidency. He worked out a roadmap of bills and laws so the Democratic Party could work together with the presidency on. They quickly got confirmed with what they had long believed, that the other person was the worst character imaginable. Rude, brash, and too hard to get about himself. The meeting was planned and arranged for one, for, by one of the Democratic Party leaders, and worst of all, there were going to be more of these meetings. When the president came back to the White House and said, well, he actually has some few, actually only a few good ideas, but what an awful man. They'll have to see him better. Despite the harsh comments, the meeting was actually somewhat constructive. They managed to work out some ideas and a note about it was circulated in the party. We might able to get something done, maybe. That'd be nice. A memorandum. A memoriam. The assassination of JFK was not just another shock to American politics, it was also a great personal tragedy to this brother Robert. The young Kenny has struggled with the grief over a long time, often even blamed himself for the elder brother's demise. Now that he's a power, he's sad that the best thing he can do is to honor John's legacy by embodying everything that he said for dignity, equality, and embodying the merit spirit of America. With charity for all. Um, Civil War has not been put on. Okay, so you have to wait for that one. With mouth swords, none. Fighting tyranny since 1776, when a great nation declared its independence, it was a statement against a tyranny of foreign masters who trampled the rights of the little man, with a noble forebears conceived and embraced the Monroe Doctrine as an assertion of a right. Or might. Our purpose and goal in protecting our whole hemisphere from the old world domination. In the 40s, we failed. As a vilest tyranny imaginable descended upon Eurasia, our complacent elitist leaders failed to prepare us for the coming storm and then cowardly tried to stay out of the wars until they arrived at our doorstep. Thousands upon thousands of young American men bleeding out in the fields of England for a war that was already lost. Our naval might shattered at Pearl Harbor was due to the administration that couldn't see the warnings. Our garrisons and marines murdered, captured, and brutalized in a squalid conditions by the Japanese. The foul conspiracy of the Japanese and Germans had dropped their doomsday weapon on Oahu. America suffered terribly, but her long suffering is but a fraction of that of the untold millions of laboring under fascist tyranny. Europe may be beyond salvation, but in Asia we may have perhaps still have a chance to strike back like avenging angels. Let's explore the ways to break the iron grip of the despotic and Japanese fear. We're not going away. Um, it was rather hard to understate understated opening truth. Only a smattering of officers, no more than 50, were gathered in the shade on plastic chairs ready for proceedings to begin. The relatively modest affair on the fields of Sumatra belied the importance of what was going to happen. This event was the grand opening of the very first branch of the Magi Sok, the special operations group of the military assistance command in Indonesia. The general went on to the stage, tapped the mic, and began speaking from a set of prepared marks. Uh, Thank you all for coming today. It is my honor to inaugurate the fine command. Magi Sok's uh, primary purpose is to train the brave, free Indonesian soldiers so they can win the war. 
Make sure that those free Indonesians will receive the best instruction they can, and such will be training with them directly. He paused for a moment. Our second purpose is to organize our forces. This command's responsibility is to ensure that our intervention is effective. This command is also a powerful sign, also shows our allies and our enemies. America's firm and total commitment to the war. In fact, to show the commitment. This commitment, the general said. Uh, this branch not, won't be our only one. Two more branches will be established soon, on one in Sulawesi, Sulawesi and the other on the West Papua. That line garnered ple polite applause, smiling and continuing with the final lines. America isn't going away, you can be sure of that. <clears throat> nice. Democracy returns. <clears throat> Excuse me. Necessary sacrifice. RFK cat herder. Now the mouse words known. President Kennedy felt increasingly confident every time he faced the press in the White House briefing room. He never felt confident about public speaking, but he felt it was getting better. Um, if you're on this too, please go ahead. Another poll making a forest full of them. Um, oh, yeah, this one here. Um, he never felt confident in public speaking, but he felt he was getting better dressed in the nation. Even so, he'd have Jack, never asked Jack's skills. The man could talk his way out of a pair of handcuffs. Momentarily sad, he banished all thought of it from his brothers, from his mind as the TV cameras blinked on. It wouldn't be good for look for him to cheer up in front of America. My fellow Americans, I speak to you today, not just from as your president, but as your leader, the helmsman of the great ship we call the United States. I come to you with a single word of unity. When our founding fathers carved this great nation out of the wilderness, of greatest strength was an unassailable unity, a spirit of togetherness, and brother which could carry them through any trial, no matter how, looking how grim. It took a deep breath. Time for the payload. There'd be plenty of support out there in the TV land who wouldn't like this, but they had to rip the bandaid off sooner or later. There's no secret that some of the national progressive fact do not support the policy of our administration, including the great cause of civil rights. I hereby say before God in America that in my administration, I'll not the United States be divided by petty factionalism in its government. I intend to work with major figures in Congress outside of the party in this issue of civil rights, particularly with a venerable senator from Texas, Lyndon Johnson. Together, the National Progressive Pact and the Republican Democrats can present a united front of civil rights, ensuring that a fair shake is given to the Americans who need it the most. Together, we can do great things. President Kennedy felt proud of himself as he stepped from the podium. Unity, a message just about anyone can believe in. At least he hoped that voters saw it that way. The only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperation. Nice. Some of our southern senators might affect other Democrats. With mouse words numb. Our nation has always been a melting pot for a multitude of peoples of all colors and creeds, and yet the idea of America as a nation for whites alone persists. Well, if it was the people's desire to put an end to this tired old sentiment that swept RFK into power. If we move forward as one country, we must remove the legal obstacles to the full integration of all races and guarantee that all might be afforded the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're likely to face stiff opposition from Southern conservatives and even within the national strengths of our own party, but we must push on in the name of a fair, more equal America. Bienvenida a la OFN. A new op-ed to Commentary Magazine, Political Analysis, Gene Kirkpatrick has welcomed the newly born nation of the United States of Columbia to the Organization of Free Nations. While Colombia has been under frozen civil war for the past decade, the Colombian Revolutionary Union recently trumped for the new Grandian government and the Peruvian Colombian Republic. The CRU, a loose coalition of leftists and liberals, was supported heavily by the Organization of Free Nations, supposed support that was crucial in the bloody conflict that had recently transpired, partially because of the significant aid that the U.S. and Colombia now fully aligns with the United States, offering much needed counterweight to increasing Japanese influence in Latin America. Kirkpatrick's fluency in Spanish comes in handy. Half the articles written in it is a direct call to both the government of Colombia and the rest of Latin America to ensure that the totalitarian elements within your government do not jeopardize the beneficial relationship that our nations now enjoy. Colombia occupies an incredibly strategic a strategically important area in the Western Hemisphere, at the very top of South America, Colombia enjoys access to both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Access will certainly come in handy, Kirkpatrick argues, in fighting German and Japanese influence in the entire world over. As usual, not everyone is thrilled by the Colombia's acceptance in the alliance. One critique of Kirkpatrick's article calls it neocolonialism and a blatant display of imperialism. Kirkpatrick foresaw these arguments responding to them within the article itself, calling a nation freely choosing to join an alliance imperialism is an insult to those currently languishing under the yoke of German and Japanese. The free world grows larger, what? Fighting tyranny. No matter your political leanings, all recent conversation between the capital invariably turned to the same subject. President RFK's announcement that the United States would seek to revise the post-war mo modus ven venvendi with Empire Japan. The policy pronouncement, though vague, has been a central policy plank of this National Progressive Pact since its formation. Though the administration has remained tight-lipped on its concrete initiatives, it's only encouraged the imagination of the political class in Washington. Members of the MPP congressional delegation could be heard throughout the week speculating on America's newfound foreign policy, ranging from doubling military and financial aid of the organization Free Nation to actively destabilizing the co-prosperity spheres via many repressive insurgencies. While stressing that the ultimate decision rests with the president, senior MPP figures emphasize that all options remain on the table. Members of the RDC have expressed skepticism towards the president's confrontational foreign policy, viewing the endeavors in naive adventurism. A senior RDC policy aide who not asked to be named, found the MPP policy is dangerously reckless with little consideration for de-escalation. 
So fun and games are marked until the next live. Go to MPP fights for America and domestic preparedness. While the National Progressive Pact was elected, the American people spoke up with one thunderous voice, turning down the entrenched elite and embracing a righteous campaign against the Japanese menace. Wherever it is to be found. At least as with the party's national committee chairman claimed it was at the last convention. In reality, our victories are a lot narrower than we'd like, and many of our voters supported us for the progressive domestic agenda rather than the campaign of vengeance many of our party leadership would still like to see as the core of our platform, in addition to the many former Dexicrats in the party. Are openly sympathetic to isolation stances and only pay lip service to continue Japan. We now have a difficult choice ahead. Probably reinstate the draft and enact war preparation measures to ensure our nation is protected against the many foreign threats and ready to act swiftly, like a bouncing eagle, to try to gradually build support from these things through a fiery, uh, fierce media campaign while optimizing your industry for wartime production. The latter is popular, but slow, and may, but slow and may leave us unready for a major conflict. The former, the opposite. I'm just going to keep escalating things here. Green and Barrett. Um, if you want to. Uh, I'll read this one. An uncomfortable silence filled the situation room as the final speaker wrapped up the presentation. Someone coughed and quickly suppressed it, this sense of the gravity of the situation. All lives were on the president and took a few moments to process everything that was happening. At the beginning of the war, the cost seemed to be manageable. They were tough to bear, of course, but they were still acceptable even uh, as long as they didn't increase. But month by month, the reports grew longer and longer, culminating in the last month's reports, which showed such a high jump in casualties and lost equipment. They started to actually uh, it startled the usually nonplus National Security Council. This month's report is when they look forward to it. Uh, we're supposed to reverse this trend. Instead, the trend only accelerated. President RFK has picked up one of the reports. It was clear that fighting now spread across the entire country. And increasingly, the boys had to fill in the gaps in hot to free in the Indonesian army. <clears throat> the results uh, result in casualties, of course. Uh, the straight, uh, weaseled, straight idea weaseled its way into the President RFK's mind. What if the U.S. was just in the war? Just left the war, cutting their losses and ran. That thought was immediately rubbished. Even if you ignore the enormous stakes, America had paid far too high a cost to leave with nothing. So they would continue then. More of the boys would die in Indonesian jungles. America would have to endure. All eyes were on the president, all in anxious anticipation of what the decision would be. The words that were finally spoken would leave no doubt of the resolve. We must win this war. There's no turning back. I like something that uh, Nixon would say, probably. Yeah, we're going to clean this area up here, too. In memor memoriam, JFK was a major politician and leader of the Democrats' uh, party, fledging social progressive circles. There was laugh and career... Er Earnestly advocate for these forward-looking ideas during his time in Congress, a champion of the growing civil rights movement in the United States. He rallied young voters to the cause of political equality as well as the need for government that actively provides for the welfare of its citizens. Shortly after Nixon's resignation, he sent to the presidency but was shot weeks later. Um, his brother RFK has now ascended to the presidency and his plans to continue to follow his legacy where he left off. In his various appearances before the public, he has made it clear that the, he will govern the same ideals and principles as espoused by his brother. The struggle for civil rights and the fate of segregation, a topic about which JFK was especially vocal, defines a large part of his platform, or campaign. Robert Kennedy has heralded the proposed Civil Rights Act as one of the cornerstones of this campaign, vowing to pass a bill during his term. Also important is Kennedy's economic policy, largely impacted by his father. Under his leadership, he claims the federal government will actively work to combat poverty through welfare programs, state grants, and other initiatives. He seems his brother acts socially progressive in general, ruin tree, ring true in all of his actions as president. Bless him. I don't like that I have to wait until after the elections are pretty much done. I do want them to, but we're going to maybe wait to go even further there. So we can do this one, but. You can work command power, which is nice, but with malice towards none. Uh, slamming the door in their faces. Dick's Crest will trust us less if we go through this. Sideline them. Strength and civil rights. It gives us a few votes at the risk of angering the nationalists. Meet the civil rights leaders. Talk with Malcolm X. King. Those who know best. Put the foot in the door. Pretty good committee in the bipartisan march straight forward. We don't have enough votes for this, of course. The glorious bill. Put the foot in the door. Name of bipartisanship. Cure the Democrats' favor by working towards together on legislation. Well, we definitely don't have enough senators. We only have 23, and there's 33 here. Um, even if we got all the RDs together, they still want to. Well, we they would vote for it, but 47 is not enough. Hmm. I wish we could wait to do this. We're going to probably go as far as we can. The Express will trust us less. I don't even count on the support anyways. I get a few, new, few votes at risk of angering the nationalists. We could try it. Most pressing issue? Refining the bill. And people cannot pass the Civil Rights Act in its current state when the White House knows it. In fact, our opponents are hedging the best precise in our awkwardness as we speak. Awareness as we speak. Hoping the presence of indecision feeds into a perception of weakness, for now such as combined to the fringes of a popular opinion. Rather than let us spread any further policy plans, have draft crafted a daring proposal to release a draft of the Civil Rights Act so extensive as to draw the outrage and ire of everyone but the most progressive Americans. The administration can scale back to a more palatable state afterwards, and in doing so, cultivate an image of prompt comp compromise and level-headedness for the president himself. It's a highly risky proposition, not least of all for the president's ratings, but one that also presents high rewards. Should the game work, then Congress will have unwillingly agreed to a version of the act we want. 
Silent the dicks correct? As always, Wall Street and the Nationals remain headaches to work with. They've not offered the slightest bit of comp compromise issue civil rights. <clears throat> Instead, content with wailing and screaming about the sacred saint state's rights whenever approached. The outsiders are a putrid state on the MPP or supporters that are a testament to the MPP's duplicity and hypocrisy. And the MPP itself, they are metastasizing cancer willing to throw away party unity for a selfish game. Only weak points of Congress, we once had no choice but to seek the support in order but trust the MPP's votes. Times have changed, however, we are now in a position to make do with the, without theirs. For President Kennedy, now is the best time to boot these up jumped rattlesnakes and alligators out of the party he leads. Which, I do want to get through all this. I want to get through all this tree. If we can basically use consequences and not have him die, we might be able to get through everything here. That's why I want to beeline through all this stuff. And, you know, we could wait and do all this stuff first. <clears throat> That's roughly one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's a year's worth of wait. 66. You wait a year first, maybe. Get through the next election cycle. Do well at the polls. And then go through here. Because you still have to do this stuff, too. Which might be worth doing in the end. Be the beast. <clears throat> War needs men. It consumes with great greed and hunger for more. And it's a sad reality of conflict. It's like that in any prolonged conflict, we would be forced to instigate the draft anyway, and if we already realize the new American dream of freeing the world from tyranny, at least Japanese tyranny, conflict is inevitable. All Americans want to take part in making this dream a reality, and dancing around it only puts their precious liberty and their aspirations further risk. The draft must be reinstated and better now, uh, while we're at relative peace, so that people get used to it. Then when the country is already bleeding and struggling in war, let us set up a task force with the Pentagon and Census Department to determine our drafting capabilities, and begin contracting factories to produce kits for greater the expanded military machine. With some luck, a bit of a domestic discontent now will mean a quick and relatively painless war in the future. As superior numbers and technology overwhelm our foes with shock and awe, better protests now than draft riots while the Japanese are showing The English game. question. President Robert Kennedy took the opportunity to sit down and enter an interview with some of his favorite broadcasters, Walter Cronkite from CBS and some of the best and brightest interviewers from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and the exotic Emler aligned British Broadcasting Corporation that still kept going on despite their defeat in the English Civil War in opposition to Thatcher's new broadcasting adver advertisement. After discussing his policies and hopes for the future, Robert dropped the bomb on the table. Gentlemen, if I may, I have, no, I have reason to believe that the England may sooner join our organization, Free Nations. At that, the him the broadcaster Scott, but the others were visibly interested. Answering. What questions he could, he told him about how the English had been making overtures to the OFN and the Pact of Light. When asked about the prospects, Robert told him that he was unsure what, that would work, but he was confident it was possible. He would do his best to see it done. Uh, as we're still trying to wrap up Africa, as we saw earlier, also Africa did capitulate, so which is very, 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 very good. And uh, at this point, we're going to go and try to go forward through this. If this doesn't work well, then the next episode will get to the point where we'll go through all of uh, this stuff first. So... Um, Silent the Dixocrats. As always, Wallace Thurman and the Nationals remain headaches to work with. They've not offered the slightest bit of compromise that they should civil rights and said content with wailing and screaming about the sacred state's rights, which I read earlier. So, this one's going to be super important. So, <clears throat> um, offer success. Testament MPs, duplicity, hypocrisy, of course. New civil rights leaders. The reputation of Wallace and was accompanied by a sudden influx of support from the American civil rights community. Cause and effect relationship is easy to explain after all. They suffered for more than most of the Jim Crow laws and are now diminished party right have enthusiastically advocated. Siding with their erstwhile coalition meant siding with those who had made them and their forebears lives of slavery after long after it was abolished. An opportunity to work closer with these advocates for freedom has presented itself in front of us. Having done away with the party's garbage, President Kennedy can now formally reach out to the colored men and women of the forefront of the civil rights movement. Co-opting their strength will be a boon like none other for the MPP, with nothing that nothing breaks ice better than bonding over the woes of a shared enemy. So Yay, I guess. Um, slamming the door. We're done making compromises and half compromises. We're done living in a nation run by the few working against the many. We are done putting up with the racist, anti-American behavior. We're done accepting token excuses for lynchings and burnings. We're opening a new chapter of American history with the Civil Rights Act, the Act of Security, Freedom, and Equality for every single American, no ifs, and or buts. With any moral, rational person, <clears throat> can see this bill is the right thing to do. Uh, we have to deal with the Congress here. So morality and rationality are essentially off the table. In fact, we've already gotten ourselves massive pushback from the Nationalists. The one about the usual federal tyranny, this state rights, that force. Uh, absurd arguments, of course, but we are going to, have to find a way to counteract them. The Republicans also begun making a way. Uh, we're going to mumble about the perceived uh, radicality of the act. We should be able to co some liberal and perhaps some moderate Republican support if we play our cards right. In any case, uh, we have a long and difficult journey ahead of us, but at the end of the road, is a society better than the founding fathers could have even imagined all those years ago? Time to get to work. Cut them down, my boys. Oh. Not planning it. Already used connections. Oh. Yeah, I should have done this one earlier, so. Uh, Alright. And we're still doing this too. It was increased by one every month. Point one. Remember the C line? This English is chance. 0, 3, 17. England is very independent right now. Anti pack propaganda. 1 to 2. Let's go with that one too. 
And they're still doing stuff up here too. Which is alright. I just use mostly just command power. I want to save our fire for as much as possible. Um, top of Malcolm X. An auspicious meeting. Dragging their feet. Or finding the bill. Malcolm X, the most boisterous and aggressive, definitely the most controversial civil rights advocate in the modern American political landscape. Leader of the Nation of Islam, pontificates passionately against injustice and of the black man by his old slave master across the South. Yet, the solution he offers for America's racial divide mirror that of the white man he so loathes. Not to heal it, but to widen and deepen it. Let's tell him the black man's own initiative. As words are appalling and offensive to the sensibilities of many, nevertheless, hatred runs deep and far from the many thousands who take them to heart. Organizing a meeting with such a radical figure doubtless to cause backlash among the more integration minded of our country and party hope remains at an impasse that he may be reached, however, and President King can work has worked with far less than than hope before. <clears throat> Consult King. Contrasting Malcolm X, firebrand rhetoric of black supremacy and doc, our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sermons of peace and friendship for a fellow man, he preaches straight light or straight into the heart of millions every Sunday mass. With a smooth bear to the soothing and inflamed the soul in equal measure, clamoring for the average Joe to seek their conscience to enhance and march forward together towards a future shared by Americans of all races and faiths. Truly one cannot ask for a better spokesperson for the civil rights movement than the good reverend in the word of God. Connecting with the community requires learning his mores, mores and customs, so that no issue will arise from interacting with him. No one knows a flock sheep better than their own shepherd, and Dr. King may be more ecstatic than most in helping the president's own than help his own, helping the president his own, for finding the bill. Americans are the greatest bunch of citizens in the world, but that's not saying much when you put them against, up against Nazis. They're still often racist, prejudiced, and selfish. That is sadly an obstacle to social justice our nation needs. The civil rights bill that would deliberate many, the, the many oppressed has come up against stiff opposition from constituents and lawmakers alike. South is playing the symbols of a past conflict, and North is indifferent. The bill will not get past this current state, will compromise unpalatable. What shall we do? Minutes to midnight. With all due respect, Ambassador Fukuda, the evidence we have is utterly indisputable, the President said. America expects, at a minimum, a formal apology, substantial compensation for our losses, and a total withdrawal of all Japanese troops from Indonesia. The Japanese ambassador was indignant. What lies? We are innocent. Us apologizing to you? Pa, who would be the reverse? You accusing us of killing your men, when it's clear as day that you're murdering our soldiers. But forget it. This is a waste of time. Before the President could respond, the ambassador got up to leave, slamming the doors he went out. After the ambassador slammed the door shut, President RFK let out a breath he didn't even know he was holding in. This meeting was much more tense than anything else he'd had in a while, but there was always good reason to be worried. But even by now, even the general public was aware that both America and Japan had soldiers in Indonesia. Both were blissfully unaware of the deeper implications, with an airy soul of noticing what was once unthinkable had become a reality. American and Japanese soldiers were shooting each other, killing each other. Of course, they couldn't say that out loud, but the president and the ambassador realized what would happen if they did. It'd be a race to the top of the escalation ladder with only the prize of nuclear annihilation. Even as their armies were slaughtering each other with all the destructive force that can only modern war could bring, both sides had to pretend it wasn't actually a war. And then they were. America and Japan locked in this uncomfortable pas de dole. I was the right to worry about how long this facade could last. Nice. They're still in South Africa, unfortunately, too, but whatever. You guys keep doing what you can do. Um, just kill them all off, as we did send soldiers to Indonesia to help them out, so... We will see. And there they are. Let's hurry and get down here. Just push as hard as we can through here. Because we did sense planes. They should be doing alright. Operation successful, of course. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Not going to really bother this meet with some hard leaders, which is good. Just about one every month. Hopefully this is a little more balanced than what it used to be in the past. Germany's not really doing too much right now. One, two, the other one. England really loves itself. Cool. What's this? Small favor? Nice. Um, meet with Malcolm X. Because he can. And go in here because he can. Dragging their feet. Strom Thurmond was no stranger to. Uh, uh, show. <clears throat> or the filibuster. Blather. Waste time. Drag your feet. Swallowed everything in red tape. Away. They issue down and change the throat in the Potomac. Even his crewmen would do anything to slow down the cause of justice. So President Kennedy wasn't surprised found that he was doing it again. The President lightly hung up the receiver. His phone was bald. Uh, jaw clenched. He wanted to slam it down, but refused to give the corpulent old toad the satisfaction of seeing riled. So that was that. After all the tax and schmoozing, the grand glad handling, the endless effing heart running compromises, Thurman and his goons were just going to dig their heels in the mud and refuse to move. Like an ordinary camel. All our requests is just so the right wingers of the party could keep their flagging, flagging dream of segregation in his future alive so much for bipartisanship. Bipartisanship. Kennedy narrowed his eyes in it as his own idea formed. Drumming his fingers on his desk, he wondered if this was entirely wise. If he did this, it would be forever, he would forever alienate the rightists by cutting them out of the legislative process of his administration. Ah, screw me, thought. They were trying to do the same thing to him. The difference was he was president. Smirky as he picked up the receiver, Kennedy dialed the office of LBJ. Mr. Senator Thurman, your ship has sailed. An auspicious meeting. We already knew that the nation was watching our efforts to pass the Civil Rights Act with bated breath. Perhaps, however, we didn't quite realize how bated the breath the national breath was. Recently, both Malcolm X and MLK Jr. have jointly asked us to come speak to President Kennedy about the struggle for civil rights. While MLK and, M and Malcolm X have certainly had and continue to have their differences, 
I certainly agree that civil rights is the most important issue that the United States face, and that a joint and agree that a joint request to speak to RFK will have more weight and importance than the two separate requests. Frankly, they're right. Combined, the weight of most of America's black population behind them, the high level of public support is hard to ignore. Plus, it's just the right thing to do to get the perspectives of actual civil rights leaders as we attempt to pass it on civil rights act. On the other hand, inviting them to the White House will certainly lead to an outcry from certain choice elements of the Congress. Do we take them up on the invitation? Should we talk over lunch and ventilate well? Hey, if you heard the jets overhead in Indonesia, you dropped through the deck and held your breath. If you were lucky, you'd still be breathing in a minute later. If you were, then you'd be stuck with whatever you had in your lungs as the oxygen in the air would combust or you'd be displaced by siren vipers. If you were lucky, you might pass out and die insensate. insensate. But heat the roaring flames unleashed by napalm. And adding buildings of bone alike would make that difficult. Anyone who would want to scream as they felt their skin burst and blacken to expose the cooking flesh inside. But if they did, they might roast from the inside out or choke obnoxious fumes. You know, all the residents of Sumatran Village, militarily worthless until an arbitrary shift in the line of contact, could do was hold their breath and run. Run away from the streets ablaze and scorched alleyways, scoot towards colder and cleaner air in the wooded outskirts. They discovered as they streamed out of their hellish prison in a bloody mangled line that sufficient ventilation brought them relief. Ventilation, measured by the bullet calibers and exit wounds, not one more. A prime television show with clapping a video or a studio audience. I'll ask the audience how many of you here know a son, husband, or cousin, uncle to fight on for America's halfway, to fight for America halfway across the world. Uh, the camera didn't pan to an audience, but the host's eyes raised along with the wave of hands in the TV studio. All of us here welcoming men, well, our men in coffins or in life altering pain and suffering for a war that the Indonesian rebels could clearly not win, not by themselves. I hope that American, Australians are. Please, at least, for the cost of hundreds of thousands or thousands of Americans dead, Indonesia has been flagged, uh, flattened, and ravaged. The crowd murmurs, some of them angry with motion. Those motions for foolish life, they continue. Uh, <clears throat> Bring your men home. There's no point for them to be in a war that nobody asks America to fight. Where violence is a point rather than a means to an uncertain end. We don't understand the Indonesians, and they don't understand us, which, what it means to live in a Christian moral society, and they want to find a way to God, and they can do it on their own dime. Applause, unprompted, and prolonged. Officer Rose, in the recent months, following Italian democratization, we have been approached by the Italian diplomatic envoys with overtures of friendship and cooperation. While I've spent years courting the Italian since the break of the Nazis, that this latest development represents a golden opportunity to bring the Italian Empire firmly into our sphere. With the control of the Suez, downs over the Mediterranean, and a colonial empire that stretches from Tunis to the Horn, Italy would make a valuable addition to the free world, and the effects of gaining an ally right on the doorstep of the Reich cannot be overstated. Every available effort should be made to bring the Italians into the OPM, unless this opportunity. Slip some of our grasp, or worse, fall into the hands of our enemies. Get me the ambassador. Oh boy. My god, do we need political power or what? Let's all king. Dictatorships and double standards. Um, and when someone opens an issue of commentary magazine, they expect to see many things. Articles on what's happening abroad in Germany. Articles about Jewish culture and religion. But most of all, articles about the political issues of the day. If someone were to pick up the 1965 November issue, they'd see the Georgetown's law to political scientist Gene J. Kirkpatrick aggressing its cover. Just under the title, they see dictatorships and double standards in bright red font. <clears throat> in the essay, Kirkpatrick offers a brutal-esque, uh, a uh, brutal Critique of the unstable foreign policy that the president's administration has enacted. She likens it to a pendulum, rapidly going between two significant extremes. She argues that the president has left her allies in the Organization of Free Nations to dry out, and that authoritarian governments with democratic institutions are not being given enough support or aid. It's by no means a short essay. The readers of Commentary Magazine have with less interest in foreign policy would no doubt skim it or pa skim, it pa skim it past entirely. But those that were interested in the field took note. Kirkpatrick introduces the concept of what is being called the Kirkpatrick Doctrine. While she doesn't go into depth, the rough idea of the Kirkpatrick Doctrine is that totalitarian governments are more likely to survive for longer, while authoritarian governments are more likely to reform or collapse. Kirkpatrick doesn't explain the specific policy applications of the doctrine. It's an essay, not a political proposal, a policy proposal. It's not difficult. To see what she thinks is the right course of action, more aid to these authoritarian countries, of course. All over the country, more and more people are starting to take into this rising political scientist, with the scathing cuts against the president's foreign failures. Already, there are rumors of a congressional or senatorial bed, even if Kirkpatrick denies such rumors, but she continues to make waves showing up at speaking events and publishing more and more papers and essays critiquing the current administration. Her essays and speeches have been featured at congressional hearings against the president and his administration, calling for motion to changes to foreign policy from Ember's Flame. Coffee with Malcolm. El Haj Malik El Shabazz, better known as Malcolm X, was not an easy man to talk to. Opinionated and brusque, he exhibited none of the following typical, typical of guests to the White House. Talking with Malcolm X was, though, thought Kennedy, rather being hit in the face repeatedly by a medieval mace after a youth spent as a petty criminal. Malcolm X had found religion, had found religion in prison with the Nation of Islam, quickly becoming the, uh, uh, the organization's public face and a major spokesperson for the racial justice. The different from many other black leaders due to his racial separatist ideals, Malcolm X has over time become one of the most prominent and well-spoken figures of for racial equality. Um, not to mention the controversial 
uh, most controversial, no matter which side of the debate you're on, as he slipped his coffee, wine, of course, would be Haram, listening to Ethel and Malcolm's wife, Betty, exchange stealthy talks with each other at the end of the table, Kennedy wondered if meeting with Malcolm X would be such a good idea. Malcolm X seems skeptical, and frankly, as Kennedy couldn't blame him. After hundreds of years of getting silent by white politicians, why would Malcolm X trust him? Kennedy wished he could somehow show the man what to lay in his heart, and his genuine commitment to justice, to racial equality, to bettering the lives of African Americans. In the end, both men left felt... Uh, feeling frustrated. Can you wonder if it had been a foregone conclusion as the phone began to ring and incense Thurman on the other end? Nobody can give you freedom if you're mad you take it. News from Tokyo. While we begin an efforts to woo the Italians in our lands, we have much received we have received recently information that the Japanese Empire is doing the same, hoping to bring about the Italians and the Co Prosperities here. That cannot be allowed to pass. Italian entry into the CPS would be a major boon to the Japanese, granting them a uh, foothold in Europe and transforming the sphere into a truly global bloc. Such a result would be unacceptable. Every available temp or used resource must be used to bring the Italians into the offense, or at least very least to prevent the Japanese from bringing them into the sphere. You cannot let Tokyo get a leg up over us in this Cold War. Apologies for speaking very quickly. 9.54. Wow, that's pretty bad. We're going to focus on ourselves for the most part, though. We're just going there. It's fine. Going there, too. So, with King. I'm meeting with King. Those you know best. Where is this one right here? I hope else can explain suffering better than those who have suffered. Those who are fortunate enough to have lived caref carefreely may learn their experiences, but theirs will be a clinical sort of knowledge. Detached, unfeeling, passive, crin crimson, itchor, spilled on by cruel, centuries old, and just becomes little more than words of black ink. Printed on plain paper, words and pictures simply to learn from, not, but not act upon. Progress may be made with the help of the fortunate careless. Defending progress in spite of convenience, on the other hand, requires those with a spirit, of temp spirit tempered only by experience. Everywhere one looks in this country, they will find no shortage of such men and women. They belong to all walks of life, all sorts of occupation, bearing scars from lashes, both tangible and invisible. Now that we've made inroads into the communities through their leaders, the towns come and accept them into our fold. Random questioning. Can we get the security checkpoints scattered throughout the season? an hours-long affair? Um, I think we did this before. So, uh, such an extent that Indonesians in the line wonder if anyone's being left through at all. But the line snake forward in minute, minute increments, giving observers enough time to observe the surroundings. They all saw the sergeant take a double and triple look at the couple crossing the threshold of the checkpoint. But for yelling at them to halt and raise their hands, several soldiers whipped towards the couple, raising the rifles as the two shakily obeyed, and another soldier told everyone to step back, shouting suicide vests over the disgruntled groans of the crowd. The man was roughly patted down with his every appendage squeezed and half manhandled before he was thrust to the ground held at gunpoint. The woman was offered no more delicacy, though she was offered the decency of an inspection inside the checkpoint booth. The crowd pretended not to hear her crying in humiliation. Tell us where you are from. Um, the sergeant's fist smacked into the detailed man's face with a sickening crunch. Tell us who you live with. <clears throat> a rifle butt slammed the man's stomach, doubling him over. Uh, oh boy. That's going to be difficult, isn't it? Oh, uh, tell us everything. The crowd sees as the two soldiers grab the man by his armpits, drag him into the waiting van with the wailing woman beside him. They watch as the man sped away into the distance the lower, the, behind the lower bayonets of the checkpoint guards. Next. Took his siren. The Japanese and the puppets in the sphere have made several overtures. Uh, Italians wooing them into alliance, including the offer of technology, favorable access to key resources. We'll need to take more action to bring Rome to our side, or at least to prevent those darn jobs from bringing them into their sphere. Where's the ambassador? God dang it. Dylan King, MLK Jr., civil rights leader, warrior, for equality, and a darn fine dinner guest. President Kennedy had spoken with Dr. King several times before, including on a campaign show, but this marked the first time they did honor being invited to the White House itself. Become the first black civil rights leader to pass beyond those gleaming doors. Thurman's coterie were up in arms about it, but who cared about what they thought? He was a president, and he had dinner with whoever he liked. After a brief photo op in the Oval Office, Dr. King, the president, and their wives had met for a private dinner away from the cameras to strengthen the relationship in the eyes of the public and discuss the cause for civil rights. Kennedy liked Dr. King and wondered if, in a finite life, reform the shackles of politics, they might have been friends in this life, however. They both had responsibilities putting them apart. King's to his community, and Kennedy's to his welfare of the nation. Nevertheless, they agreed on the absolute necessity for racial justice, and that the right to equality is deserved by all Americans. King was no radical, he understood the real politics, and knew that Rome wasn't built in a day. But the president could still see the yearnings for a better future behind King's eyes. They only hoped that he could help that dream become a reality. Only love can drive out hate. Smoke and mirrors, no? Where's the Italian one? Stay true. Hmm. Interesting.
Battle for early. Eh, no, that's happening. That's good. Um, well, investing diplomats. FPP's popular decreases. We did it once. Nice. And we're still in South Africa, but we're slowly winning this war here, so. Let's go ahead. I don't think they can really offer too much resistance against us now, too. Put this for that left, too. Why well, expand the old fan? Both the core of prosperity sphere and the organization of free nations. Courting the new democratic nation of Italy, there's been an increasing push from the U.S. to accept to convenience the government to put more effort in convincing the newly appointed Italian government. No, I'm going to go there to support. Political analysis of Gene Kirkpatrick, writer for Commentary Magazine, also weighs on the issue in her new article, Why Expand the OFM, in the article. Kirkpatrick refers to the empires of Italy as a Western nation with Western institutions, claiming that the administration of Italy to the Alliance would provide a crucial counterweight to increasing uh, German influence in both Europe and the world. Access to the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and the oil that brings are all crucial to the United States and her allies, Kirkpatrick argues. While the Middle East may be relatively stable now under a variety of Italian line regime and dictatorships, the probability of it remaining stable is unlikely, Kirkpatrick argues. That the new threat may come from the Islamists or the Nazis themselves, but Italy would provide a crucial ally in the region. Kirkpatrick calls on the president and the government in general to increase diplomatic overtures in an attempt to move the Italians into the alliance by any means necessary. Be it military or economic promises, Kirkpatrick argues that no cost is too high for a new, strong ally in Europe. Where will the, where will the dominoes fall? Superseding circumstances. The crowd had already been gathered for several hours outside the police station by the time the foreign colonel arrived. The police straining to hold their cordon as the officer heard inside. Everyone knew what had happened. Uh, the city far from the front and the bars and clubs had been terrorized by foreigners, the one who took offense at every perceived slight. And sometimes did nothing at all. Drunkenness was the excuse to use it first. Uh, so all while the foreign soldiers and sailors were, were wont to be, but when the pattern emerged, some doubted that, that the culprit even needed to ship sip before whaling a target du jour. <clears throat> what is this one, too? Uh, today they hadn't found a bloody behind a dumpster. Uh, they had it found there, mounted upon a blackened and bruised heap of that had long been ceased moving. He sent five more men to the hospital as they tried to restrain him before the police arrived and whisked him away. The mob demanded justice. How many more other men and women had been sent to the hospital on account of this monster? Uh, but the police held him back, not because they wanted to, but because the police commandant had been told in no certain terms that they were superseding circumstances. The crowd roared in fury uh, as a foreign colonel emerged from the building. While the brute following behind, a psychotic smirk plastered on his face, they flushed against the police lines, the foreigners clambered into the wailing, waiting car, screaming at their in the distance. Just wore a uh, uniform in Indonesia, except for those in another uniform entirely. Just one outrage among men. We need a union. Proposed renovation of the Greenwich Village, but the council has, has vote, uh, failed on a 27 to a 24 vote. The project will not move forward, but may be reproposed during the next session. The column boys the Speaker of the New York City Council barely reached before it was overwhelmed by the cheers of the gallery. Greenwich Village inhabitants had packed the council room to pre put pressure the representatives against the temptations of the, developer, of the developers lobbying. A Senate celebration with Jane Jacobs and a Greenwich Village civic group of volunteers, all devoted New Yorkers determined to keep their homes. It was not Jacobs and GVCG's first clash with the development projects pushed by wealthy interests as they had already once been available once before. Jacobs avoided words like triumphs to describe her past success. What sort of victory was it to be allowed to keep your home? Jacobs and her allies in March petitioned, protested, even organized the residents of every building on each affected block to pressure the council members and make their voices heard. The small community of old homes from the 19th century seemed quite like the David to the developers Goliath, however. The development of its planned inclusion of a major road cutting through the heart of the community has united the locals. Now the power brokers in New York would retreat, regroup, and rework the plans. The right pressure on the anti-development council members, the right carrots offered to the key members of the community, could see the project squeak through the next time. Whatever came through, Jacobs and her neighbors would be there to meet it. After all, when someone comes to take your home, you'd fight. A warrior for the cities. Oh, we're down to 8.1. Oh, someone's lowering our influence. Over go there. Don't want to spend too much, but you still have to spend quite a bit. Nice. And one last push. With every line uh, 
uh, typewritten into a clean sheet of paper every debate settled amicably. Every item brought to consensus. An MPB inches closer towards its ultimate goal, slowly the final version of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, take shape, months of sore throats and fatigue had given birth to this one end product. The American people. I eagerly wait the day to put a vote, not a definite date, rather than an estimation that shifts with the wind. Neither say so or we. All that remains is sort of minor minutia, utterly trivial in comparison to the hurdles we have long traversed. With one last burst of speed, one last push, we can finally tap the last dot and begin the countdown towards the roll call. Well, hopefully. We're almost done with all the CIA stuff there, which is nice. Just keep pushing here. Push, keep pushing in, in South Africa, too. That'd be good. That'd be very good. Maybe two. The one, though, you should have enough. Uh, Jesus freaking Christ. TNO just has so much reading. Um, the hidden lives of the urban world. Philip Parker rarely thought about sidewalks beyond whether or not streets had them or were behaved correctly. It certainly never thought about what effect they had on social order, yet the book he was reading entitled The Death and Life of the Great American Cities. And its author, Jane Jacobs, opened his eyes to urban matters he had never considered before, having previously considered cities merely agglomerations of people in concrete. Jacobs claimed that sidewalks act as a stage for intricate ballet, in which individual dancers and ensembles all have distinctive parts which miraculously reinforce each other and compose an orderly whole. It was through the sidewalks that urban interacted with the cities around him, and the quality of the sidewalk entirely a function of what was attached to it, be it a store, subway, station, or spark. Even more interesting was Jacobs' the concept of walkable sidewalks helping to prevent crime. It is a fact, after all, that criminals are less inclined to operate within a view of the public. Rather than rely on continual police presence, Jacobs asked why not instead encourage a degree of passive societal surveillance through promoting walkable cities and streets. Through ensuring buildings facing facing face the roads and neighborhood and plenty of watchful disapproving eyes uh, discouraging any ne'er do wells, Hart put the book down. Arthur, please get in touch with Miss Jane Jacobs in New York. Tell her I admire her struggles for community and that I've been reading her book. If it's all right with her, I have quite a few questions about her ideas. The aide nodded and hurried off on the errand as Hart continued reading the book. He wanted to be prepared for his meeting with Miss Jacobs after all. A new Kansas City or an older one? Back, uh, blue on blue. The soldier was a quiet one, everyone said, didn't talk with others much, never told anyone where he was from or why he joined the army. Not that anyone asked. All anyone cared about now in Indonesia, especially the foreign advisors, was that you pick up your gun, point, and pull a trigger. It was good at that, everyone agreed. Good enough to earn himself a clap on the back and free drinks of the pop from the advisors, they were the only ones with enough money for that. He drank at first enough to put out an elephant, earning him two days' punishment in detail. Later, he didn't touch alcohol at all. The advisors were happy. They told him that he'd gotten used to killing, just like them. But he could enjoy the full use of your senses, even after watching a montage of death and gore, then you know you were normal again. Every morning, the soldiers would listen to a readout of the changes along the contact. Mostly, it was localized to the specific sector, but every so often, a fairway city's capture or destruction would be uh, mentioned. A reminder, the officer said, of what they were fighting for. It had been a day as normal as any other soldiers filed out, leaving the foreign advisors to discuss the day's objectives. Before the soldier in question blew their brains out with a service rifle, painting their red tent before adding his own blood to the mix. Snuffed out, just like the home body, hometown nobody knew. Jean Kirkpatrick in Alexandria. Uh, she was at a crossroads in her life. She didn't know exactly what she was going to do or how she was going to get there. She'd been a recognizable part of congressional hearings for a while now, being able to push and pull things in the right direction. Yet she still wanted more. While she was very much a woman focused on foreign policy, she wasn't unknown to the world of domestic politics. With a firm belief in the importance of unions and support for civil rights, she fell right in line with the Democrats' platform, which made sense. She'd been registered as one for as long as she could remember, of course. Knowing what, part, what party she was was part of didn't help her accomplish her goals, even if she knew what her goals were. It's a Thursday that the answer to the particular question revealed itself. Uh, she had recognized the name of the caller in the D.C.-based area code, but she was glad that she had picked it up. Howard W. Smith, of Virginia's 10th Congressional District, was retiring and the Democratic National Convention was looking for a new candidate. Gene Kirkpatrick was the perfect answer to the question. Currently living in Alexandria, right across from the Potomac from D.C., she was already well known in the political world as a staunch interventionist abroad and someone who values the importance of unions and progressive policies domestically. Choosing her was a no-brainer for the Democratic and National Convention higher-ups. She was perfectly in line with her goals and beliefs. Without a moment of hesitation, Kirkpatrick accepted. A million thoughts were already racing through her mind. She was already compiling a list of things she had to do, from making signs and making calls. She envisioned a very busy next couple of days. The fire grows hotter. Then I want to get through this bill first. Civil Rights Act. An act to confer, uh, to enforce the constitutional right to vote, to confer jurisdiction upon the district courts of the United States of America to provide injunctive relief against discrimination in public accommodations. To authorize Attorney General to institute suits to protect constitutional rights on public facilities and public education or extend the commission on civil rights to prevent discrimination in federally assisted programs to establish commission on equal employment opportunity and for other purposes. The title is droll legalese, but do not be fooled by its outward appearance. The Civil Rights Act heralds the greatest flowering of American political freedom since the Bill of Rights, steering into the country's book of law, the rights held withheld to select citizens in many states. Millions of Americans will see their fortunes proof at last, breathe true freedom at last, win his jubilee at last, our jubilo. Should this act pass the baptism of Congress? The fate of millions now hangs in the balance as to the sacrifices we have made to reach this point. Pray that our lawmakers will listen to their conscience and make the right choice. Snakes and suits. 
President Kennedy was already in a foul mood before he opened the door and fa uh, received a fanciful. A face full of pungent cigarette smoke, it was just like Thurman and Walls to drag him down to the trip of this capital, forced him to answer their summons like a peasant to his lord. Well, if he wanted to get anything done, he had to play the game for now. Uh, Tweedledum and Tweedledee uh, sat uh, gelatinously under the fluorescent lights like a pair of smoldering dragons. God darn it, it reeked. Kennedy tried not to show his disgust, he joined him at the table. Mr. President, Grog Thurman's uh, throat seared from decades of homegrown Carolina smoke. Let's cut right to the chase. Suddenly, he slammed a manila folder on the table. Refusing to give him the satisfaction of a flinch, Kennedy leaned forward to read the title. It was a surprise to see it was the latest draft of the nascent civil rights bill. Turning said to Excel, Wallace drawled. Sir Thurman and I have been reading this over. Now, Bobby, don't you reckon it's a little too soon to be pushing all this? Now, I don't know about them fancy boys of Massachusetts, but the good old people of Alabama ain't too fond of sudden change, especially when it's going against an overwhelming view of the state. Well, gentlemen, began Kennedy, not getting any further beyond being cut off by Thurman. Now, now, Bobby, said Thurman, as though he were talking to a disobedient child. You ain't done speaking yet. Now, George and I have been in Washington for a good deal longer than yourself, and old Jack, God rest his soul. Was that the slightest of smiles and walls slips? Kennedy felt his jaw clench. How dare they drag Jack into this? Taking a drag, Thurman continued, sometimes you've got to give a little if you want your friends to play friends, or say friends. Loosen the old belt, so to speak, so why don't George and I make a few revisions of here draft and send it through in the morning? It bears nicotine stained teeth to Kennedy. A uh, little smell, utterly without mirth. Don't wish to talk about it, we're done here. Fine, do as you will. <clears throat> but it's fun being a radical. Hmm. Ah. This is the one you want to do, definitely. We go up by 0.5, we go up by 1. Doing okay there, doing okay here. Well, one less push. Oh, it's ready, ready to go to committee. Or oh, we're not in crisis. The bill must reach it for any cost. So, good in the U.S. has become by far the single most contentious issue of our time, drawing the impact of even our foreign affairs. Neighbors spit on neighbor for the color of their skin, activists clash in the streets, fighting for the future of president. The Senate floor is dominated with endless debates and inter-party conflict, while well, even inter-party conflict, too. What goes on, America cannot call itself a united country, and the chaos will only continue to build if nothing else is done. It falls to administration to resolve this generational debate once for all. Friends in low places, look on Thurman and Wallace's face. As when they politely told them to F off to back to the bog where they crawled out of was priceless, but when, it, when the joy of sticking it to the dudes had worn off, Kennedy was left with the consequences. Thanks to little son, he pulled up the right wings and effectively back, blackballed him. Which is why I was so surprised when he picked up the phone a few days later after the incident to find Thurman on the other end. After they exchanged a few terse pleasantries, Thurman got down to the meat. Listen, Bobby, I might have been Nixon's bull back in 60, but I ain't some idiot who don't have any idea how Congress works. The president is as president does, and crap, if they want a little. It's only fair to give a bill back, too. Well, it cuts both ways. Kenny could feel another uh, headache coming on, tying around his temples like a diadem. You want me to do a favor, Strong? Get to the darn point. A touch of irritation, scraping at a southern foe, geniality. geniality. Let me continue. We ought to smooth things over, is what I'm saying. I'm willing to finagle my boys in Congress to support and civil rights legislation, but there ain't no way they'll swallow it this way as it is now. You want this thing to come law about it? You want your legacy to be civil rights? You want to get those Negroes voting national progressive for the next hundred years? I can make that happen, but only if you play ball and make a few changes to the bill. Tone down some of the more forceful clauses. You do that, you'll get it through Congress. Now I'm done hanging like a fish on a hook. You can make a few compromises, and we can all be buddy buddy like Rep Dems, or I can bat every single one of your bells out of the Senate like I'm Babe Ruth. What's going to be? Practice swinging center because there's more pitches to come. Oh boy. And we can save up to like 28 days. Yeah, so that's good. So now all we have left is one. I'm not going to focus over there. We can do this. Good. How are we doing down here? Go in. Senator, 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 Senator scolded. Remember all those juggling balls we had to keep in the forest before uh, civil rights bill became law? Well, we dropped one. Thurman and his coterie of crypto Confederate goons have somehow been informed of the renewed partnership with Johnson and his rage of being played once again for a fool. Thurman has withdrawn all support for legislation, including civil rights. Rumors from the capital is that the usual genial, genial Carolinian flew into incandescent rage when he was informed, shouting himself hoarse. We're in the mud now. Thurman has instructed all the members of the party's right wing of the faction of the Congress to boycott the legislation, voting absent on all of our bills. Not only that, but him and most of his lackeys are refusing to take calls from the White House. It's not likely he can keep this forever unless he wants to go down in the public's eyes and obstruction his dinosaur hell bent on fracturing the party for petty personal grievances. But he can certainly keep his tantrum going until civil rights comes up for voting. All we can do now is pray that we made the right choice and that our alliance with the Republicans will get us through this. Civil rights is making it through come hell or high water. We're on the home stretch. So when can we vote on it? Let's 
final stretch with a typical flourish. President Kennedy tore the final page of his civil rights bill from the top right and laid it face down at the pile. Breathing deeply, he allowed himself a moment of pure, unfiltered satisfaction. All the tumult and politicking, all the alliances of fortune broken had led to this moment. Exalting, or exhaling, Kennedy slowly descended from the clouds in the Oval Office, back to reality with its harsh lights and painful compromises. Kennedy felt like his knees popped as he stood, followed closely by the crack of his spines, he gave it a much-needed stretch. In a minute, he called for his secretary to bring the draft to the typing pool so they could clean it up and copy it. But for now, he was simply happy to enjoy the quiet solitude of the Oval Office at twilight, where nobody was trying to take something from him. After the realization that it was, in fact, twilight, the president did a double take straight into the window. The sky that had rich saltwater taffy color only, got only for a few minutes as the sun sank below the horizon. Had it really been there tapping, tapping away for six hours? Well, now came the hard part. Uh, getting it through Congress. No matter the terms, there would always be dudes in power who wanted nothing more than to spend their lives trying to keep black people down. Well, he thought as he sat back down, screw them. They might be stuck in the ways of Jefferson Davis, but America was moving on to into a brighter future. Sign, so President Kennedy called for a secretary as the sunset piano. Almost there. Nice push. America was the issue. If you're with that, please go ahead. Good, as we should. But I think we're going to end the episode here. We're going to continue pushing on and see what else we can do here um, and try to get some work passed in the next episode. No guarantee that'll happen, but, you know, it'd be nice if it did, just to see what we could do and eventually get George Romney in power. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll continue fighting around the world and uh, make an RFK not die, hopefully. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.